Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. And more specifically, we're talking about water today. Water, water everywhere. Not a drop, actually. Um, so if you uh, go on uh, YouTube and just uh, search for floods, you will find dozens and dozens of um, flood videos about floods that have happened in the past 24 hours. Now, the, the world is covered with floods. Not the media, I mean, in terms of the you know, the print press uh, or the cable news, um, but but YouTube, they got a million floods there. We're having a lot of floods and we're having a lot of droughts. And we'll discover, discover that in greater detail in this show with Tim Apicello, my co-host. We're going to talk about water, water everywhere and problems. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you, Jay. Glad to be here. So you were talking a minute about one implication of floods on the mainland as visited here in Hawaii. Uh, and it's about flood insurance. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, I experienced this also in Washington State because Washington State was uh, has a lot of rivers, and certainly we had many, many, many uh, floods from those rivers of overflow. And the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, is the only carrier of flood insurance. And so the problem I have is uh, properties that are completely destroyed by flooding. Um, this flood insurance program continues to pay over and over again uh, for recovery, for reconstruction. Uh, the problem is they're in the same location as where the flooding occurred time and time again. So what a waste of taxpayer dollars. What a waste of premium. What a, what a waste of resources uh, versus the requirement to relocate the property or, excuse me, re relocate the home, build elsewhere, and uh, not have to pay for damage uh, in the future years. Yeah, you got all these agencies, including insurance companies like that one, um, telling people, yeah, why don't you just rebuild? Um, no, nobody, nobody really recognizes the problem here. And I don't think we as a society recognize the problem. You know, out of every X number of um, stories that you hear about floods and drought, um, there's only a small percentage where they say, hey, this is climate change. We got to do something. You know, uh, Al Gore says we have the technology, we can do something. And I guess uh, Joe Biden says that, but we don't do anything. So it continues and it gets worse. You know, as the climate warms, the clouds above, uh, because they're warmer, can hold more water. And as a result, when it rains, it rains heavier. And it is raining heavier all over the world now. You know, the YouTube videos I mentioned are not just limited to the U.S., although they're in dozens of states. Um, they're in China, you know, everybody's heard about that. China has had some terrible floods lately, the last couple of days, and huge, huge bridges have washed out. A lot of people have died. You know, that's, that's the part that troubles me. Um, so, so what's happening here is this, this lethal mechanism of climate change is sort of taking over the world and we're not really paying attention to it. It's a test of humanity. Hey, do we really care about UFOs? You know, and the news is filled, filled to the brim with Trump. What's more important, an existential threat to our society around the world? Or Trump, what he had for breakfast? I don't care about Trump. Um, and, and the problem is, no matter what happens, we aren't going to be able to pay attention to climate change and therefore floods. So here's a map of uh, the rainfall around the world uh, from NASA, from satellites. You can see that we have rainfall and floods everywhere, and uh, it's getting worse and worse. Um, and this is the current map, 2023. This is what's happening, just to give you. This is the current map. This is what's happening. Um, and, so, and then here's another map uh, about, um, about droughts in the United States from NOAA. And you can see a good part of the country is suffering droughts. And we're not, we don't have a map on heat. Don't forget heat, Tim. Heat is another one of the things that kills. Um, so bottom line is the maps are showing the, you know, the uh, acceleration of these processes. And I don't think we have to have a map to show that it's really hot right now. And people are dying as a result of the heat, not only in the United States, but everywhere. Um, Agriculture. What about agriculture? Uh, agriculture is like an immediate effect of a flood or a drought, but it goes further, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it does. In fact, uh, speaking of bodies of water and, and farming, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, you know, we have this, this effect called the conveyor belt, the Atlantic conveyor belt. It's a system of currents that transfer warm, <clears throat> warm water up to uh, northern Europe and the cold waters of northern Europe back down to the tropics, down to South America. And this, this conveyor belt is essential for the atmosphere. And what's happening is because of global warming, um, we know Antarctica is melting. So you have fresh water from the melt um, going into the ocean, and that affects the salinity of, of the ocean, particularly in this, this area of the conveyor belt. So less salt water uh, slows down this conveyor belt, and the transference of warm water, cold water, uh, starts to decrease. It's estimated that this conveyor belt has slowed down, I think 15% is what I read, um, over, over a 100-year period. But um, again, with the introduction of more fresh water into our oceans, uh, if this conveyor belt slows down significantly, you could see, it's estimated, I didn't do the science, but I've read enough about uh, the estimation of three and a half uh, Celsius decrease for Europe. Well, three and a half Celsius, I think, is like 35, 38, 30, 38 degrees in, in Fahrenheit. Uh, what a dramatic dip in temperature that would bring. And what would that do to farming to get to your original point? Uh, it would impact it severely. And, of course, we have food, food shortage issues. Yeah, I, I want to mention, so there was an article I saw yesterday about Antarctica, how the ice in Antarctica was melting at a rapid rate. Then, you know, and that's um, that's new news. The old news is the ice in Arctic uh, has been melting at a rapid rate. Um, this is going to have global effect. And we can sit here in Hawaii and say, oh, that's not going to affect us. Oh, yes, it will, because extreme weather is linked to all of that. And, and we are going to get some of that. But let's talk about food, because if you can't grow crops um, and, if, and if people like Putin um, are destroying dams, you know, so though destroying agriculture in the fertile areas of Ukraine and stopping the passage of ships um, with grain in them that could go to feed starving people in Africa, you have all kinds of implications. People are starving and they will starve more as climate change proceeds. You want to talk about that? Well, we talked about it actually a couple of shows ago and um this sort of uh, area of food shortage causes migration patterns. And migration patterns, whether it be legal or illegal, creates burden on those countries where the migration is heading to. And then on a pol political basis, uh, dictators seem to like to use illegal migration issues as a wedge to put themselves in power. And then you have political problems with the would-be dictators of the world. And I won't say Donald Trump, but I just did. <laughs> Well, you know, the thing about the autocrats is that it, it, it happens at both ends. I mean, what happens at the end, for example, Sudan, where they are starving, um, and it's not just because of climate change, although climate change is one factor. It's because uh, they think it's more important to shoot each other up. Uh, the two armies, you know, shooting everybody in the middle. Well, people are starving. So, you know, you have uh, the deterioration of, of civil society. And so food and the deterioration of civil society are related. At, that's at the starvation end. Okay, at the migration end, you have the same thing. You have a deterioration of civil society. And you're right, I totally agree that, you know, autocrats take advantage of both ends. Um, the, the guys fighting each other and killing everybody in the middle in Sudan, in part, are taking advantage of, you know, of starvation. And the people in, in Europe are irritated with the migrants, in part because the migrants disrupt their society. So what, what happens is climate change is disrupting human flow, to take Ai Weiwei's term for it, human flow all over the world. And we could go through YouTube and otherwise and find videos of all the disruption that is happening right now. We're not talking about a year ago or six months ago. We're talking about right now. And yet, that's not raw meat enough to get to the top of the headline stack. What gets to the top of the headline stack is your unmentionable friend um, sitting in court right now in Washington. So let's let's go to um, let's go to. Um, um, I know this isn't an official meeting or anything, but a point of order here. Uh, yes. Would you please 
tell the stenographer to remove the word friend, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> so we just don't we just don't respect Mother Nature. I mean, those dams that, that are being built in Ethiopia, the dam that exists in, in Egypt, um, are huge. They're the biggest dams in Africa. And uh, what's troubling about it is that, yes, they're useful for hydroelectric power, um, for agriculture, I arguably. Um, but at the same time, they're so big that they're going to create problems uh, for water supply and for a civil society. It is likely there's going to be a big fight between Ethiopia and Egypt over the Blue Nile and the Nile. Um, so when you see, you know, uh, these organizations or states building huge dams and changing water flow, it only adds to the problem. Um, and I don't think there's a comprehensive on how we collectively, globally deal with all of that. Um, I, if uh, Ethiopia wants to build a dam, who's going to stop it? Egypt can't stop it. Jay, you're talking about fights in Ethiopia and, you know, um, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, around the world. I, I think we should talk about the fights that are going to occur, the water wars between uh, Phoenix, L.A., and Palm Springs. Uh, you know, the Southwest is drying up. Look at Lake Mead. Uh Goodness sakes, that is going to develop into quite the bitter warfare, uh, both politically and just, you know, generally. Yeah, you see how it's stretching government already. There was a 60 Minutes piece on it, and, and this is not the first time 60 Minutes has covered that issue, um, about the Colorado River, which is pretty much dried up. And it's a source of water for agriculture all, all over the West in, a, you know, six or seven or eight states. And the problem there is that there is really no good consensus mechanism to distribute the water. Um, and so what happens is it gets more and more tense. This tests our federalist, our, our federal system. I'm sorry. This tests our system. It tests our rule of law, if you will. If we don't have a system um, that equitably distributes the water, or better yet, if we don't have a system that prevents the lack of the water. But right now, it's heading in a very bad direction um, for the rule of law, for water, for drinking water, um, for irrigation water, for agriculture. And, you know, you can't run a city without water. And what's happening is the water is drying up at the source. In the, you're right, in the United States. So it won't be war between, oh, I don't know, Arizona and California, no. But it'll be a fight in court. It'll be a fight in Congress. And as we know, that's not going to get resolved very easily when the Republicans don't believe in climate change. They don't care. It'll work itself out. But it won't. Well, it'll be a competition between water for agriculture versus water for residential commercial purposes. Yep, exactly. OK, and at the same time, you know, my, my review of the YouTube videos, which is shocking to me, I did not, I did not expect to find all the videos of all the floods all over the country. Water is being distributed through those warm clouds. So in one place, you have a drought where people can't grow crops anymore. And in another place, you know, you have the whole city, like in Montpellier, uh, Montpellier, Vermont, and, you know, where the city is being destroyed as we speak by these really uh, awful floods that, are, that, that have killed people. Um, and, and that's not the only one. I mean, just don't count them on YouTubes all over the country. I don't know why anybody doesn't, you know, rise to this and say, wait a minute, you guys, we are in crisis. Why are we not rising to the occasion? Um, <laughs> you know, my thoughts are, you know, actually people are responding. Um, many coastal areas of Florida, Miami specifically, is literally trying to raise its elevation um, away from the flooding zoning. So, I mean, it is happening. Uh, is it getting national attention? Not that much. But uh, it's not just the flash floods, which you described, but, we're, you know, it's the river flooding and certainly the coastal, the coastal flooding, which is increasing its elevation. Uh, so there's three areas of flooding that's going to impact basically the interior of the nation, the coastal regions of the nation, and then again, where you, where you describe where uh, accumulation of humidity, 
uh, is in the form of flash flooding. So I don't think anyone's spared the, when it comes to um, lots of water, but nothing to drink. Yeah, water, water everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, I say Vermont, you know, but it's like all over the country. Every every point on the country has a fair share of this, even even places where you didn't think they had enough water to have a flood. They have floods and the floods are really mean and destroying things. Talk about insurance. Who's going to pay for all the damage to the roads and the buildings and, the, you know, well, pu public institutions and facilities? Um, it's, when we settle down over this, if we ever do, we're going to have a huge bill um, to pay for all this damage. And who's doing anything about dealing with climate change? You know, we, we really aren't doing anything about it. I'm sorry. And, and it's not only the United States and obviously China who should get a lesson out of this enormous flood they're having right now. Um, and, and the United Nations, what is the United Nations doing? It's like humanity is stuck in the headlights. You know, you mentioned, you know, property damage, but I'm looking at the cost, um, you know, to the, to the population. I mean, we looked, we saw UK being flooded. We saw Germany being flooded. We saw our East Coast being flooded. Uh, a lot of it's through river overflow. Think of the think of the health effects of standing water day in and day out. Um, I'll just go through a quick list of, of diseases that's associated with standing water. Uh, obviously, standing water in a city um, environment, you have the uh, the mix of sewage water with the flood water. So here comes a whole host of nasty diseases: cholera, dysentery, um, typhoid, tetanus, hepatitis A. Let's not forget necrotizing fasciitis, the flesh-eating bacteria that uh, resides in, in bacteria in, in, in standing floodwaters. Uh, let's not talk about the vector-borne diseases if the water is you know, constant and doesn't recede. Uh, West Nile disease, even parts of our, south, our southern parts of the United States of malaria, uh, things of that nature. And then let's talk about mold, the continuation of, of, of standing mold, black mold, um, called stocky botrius. Lucky Botrys, um, horrible effects on your respiratory system. And sometimes once you contract it, you can't rid yourself of it. So there's a, there's a human cost, there's a health cost that at this point is not describable of the cost to resolve it. You mean aside from drowning uh, and aside from starvation, uh, there's all these diseases, including diseases you can't even figure out yet because... Um, they could come from the mutation of viruses, you know, just like COVID. Another COVID comes from the mutation of this, this COVID or some other COVID. And then you have delivery systems that didn't exist before. The water itself is a delivery system that carries all these uh, pathogens around with it to places that it didn't carry before. And, and mosquitoes and other bugs and small animals um, become the delivery system. So world health is jeopardized by water issues like this. Um, and I don't know if anybody's really doing anything about that. The science knows. We know. We made a movie about it. We made a movie about the relationship of climate change and COVID. And we found by talking to a dozen scientists that indeed that was a, a true connection. It still exists and it could be worse because climate change is worse. We should make another movie, Tim. Oh, GJ, you know, a movie, it's a great idea. But you know what we really need? And you asked me this question, I think it was the last show, two shows ago. And you said, what would you do, Tim? And, and so let's go to the heart of the matter. It's climate change as a, as a result of CO2 emissions. What is the CO2? It's fossil fuels. Who controls the fossil fuels production? Well, the fossil fuel companies. Who lets them continue to do this? Um, the politicians, because they're stymied in Congress. Who, who causes the Congress to be stymied? Guess what? The fossil fuel companies. How do they do that? In the form of political action campaign donations. Money stops Congress from solving this problem. The voting public stops the solution of this problem because they keep not taking their politicians to task because they're being bought and paid for by the fossil fuel companies. We only get to this problem one way, and that is to reduce CO2 emissions. I'm sorry. I'm sorry the GOP doesn't like to hear that. I'm sorry that their precious Joe Manchin uh, you know, approach to coal companies and fossil fuel companies don't like to hear that, but that's the gospel truth.
Well, you're talking about a, a kind of flaw in our society. It's a flaw in the way we do government, the flaw in the way we you know, allow self-interest to rule policy. Uh, and, I, and I think it's, it's getting worse and more memorable. And, it, and it's, it's partly it's, it's the media. You know, what we should be hearing is what uh, Al Gore was saying 20, 25 years ago. Hey, this is existential. We have to do something about this right now, today. And we have it. Um, COP 21, COP 22, COP 23. And people really aren't excited about it. Instead, we're excited about, um, you know, UFOs. We're excited about uh, Hunter Biden. Um, we're excited about all the stupid issues that are raised by the Republicans, mostly in Congress, and who block efforts to do anything about climate change. The result is our government is stuck and it doesn't do anything. And, that, and we're the leader on this. So if we don't do anything, nobody else does anything. <clears throat> and, and that also goes for, uh, you know, Ukraine. You talked about uh, autocrats and the like. Um, it's, it's, in, it's not in their interest to deal with climate change. They'd rather have crises. Um, they, they'd rather not deal with climate change. So what's happening is under the hood, uh, we're building up our own, our own destruction. Um, and this is really tragic because the U.S. probably more than anyone contributes and the U.S. more than anyone knows the risks. And yet, and yet, we, we're spending all our time on political issues. Yeah. We're going to be sucked into... <laughs> there won't be any oxygen left uh, after the Trump trial, trials, I should say. And uh, why are we spending all our time on that? Um, we should be spending our time saving ourselves. So this is the biggest problem. It's the story of our the biggest story of our lifetimes. I always refer to the, um, the communications uh, department at UH where the uh, journalists up there who teach journalism say, there's no question, this is the biggest story of our lifetimes, climate change. And yet uh, we seem to be ignoring it. Uh, and yet it gets worse while we, while we watch. So um, I don't understand the madness. Well, I do, actually, because in the hands of a few politicians, they've been successful to mock uh, the notion that CO2 emissions is a direct correlation to our climate change. They've made it a mockery, and therefore it's a laughingstock issue. So now the Democrats go, well, I can't touch it because I'll be laughed, I'll be laughed at. I won't be taken seriously if I try to seriously address it. Ever since 2000 and, you know, an inconvenient truth from Al Gore, um, it's been the social wedge issue of mockery. Uh, you know, politicians aren't stopping policy. What they're doing is they're encouraging the destruction of this planet. So if I wanted to get on board with semantics, I'll stop using the word of politics or excuse me, policy. Uh, it is a green light to go ahead and destroy this planet. And um, the media has a hand in it because they're scared to touch it. Yeah, what they should be doing is hammering on it every single day and, and telling us that people are dying and will die in great numbers if we don't do that. I mean, there's a raw meat story, but... Yeah, I don't, I don't think people care about that anymore. I, I, you know, I'm more interested in my 401k and the fact that I could fill my um, GM 150 up with, with gasoline. I, I don't care about people dying. That's, you know, that's a news story. It happens every day. So what? You know, that's, I hate to say it, but we've become as a society desensitized to the death of our, our, our fellow citizens. And I'll cite another example, mass shootings. Uh, I'm sorry, but no one reacts to mass shootings anymore. Our, our fellow citizens are being shot down in cold blood, and it's ho-hum, another news story. You know, it's like that great scene in one of Sylvester Stallone's movies um, where he's in a, a supermarket. Um, and these guys are um, threatening everybody in the market. And um, they say to him, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, you don't, if you don't listen to us, we're going to blow the place up. And his response is, eh, that's okay. I don't shop here. And, and I, I keep hearing that. I actually remember head. that movie. It was a really bad movie, but I, I do recall <laughs> the line. <laughs> and so I think there's, there's something from that movie in what you say. I don't, I don't shop here. 
It doesn't affect my interest. It doesn't affect my daily life. It doesn't affect, you don't think. But it, but it does. But it, course, they just can't it see it underneath the, the multiple layers of impact. Yeah. Well, the thing is that um, it's, it's, again, like that story about the guy who refuses to take a vaccine and he's dying in the hospital. And um, the doctor says, you're dying. And he says, well, okay, okay, I get your point. I'll take the vaccine. The doctor says, sorry, buddy, um, too late for you. You can't, you can't take the vaccine, won't help. So the same thing here. I mean, when people finally get the idea, when they see their communities being destroyed, their health, when they find themselves starving, when their 4OK doesn't mean anything at all, um, then they say, oh, I'll take the vaccine. You know, what, what can we do to, to slow down climate change or stop it? And the answer is, too late, buddy. You know, we're going to lose billions of people around the world. Lose means they're going to die. Um, and, and our society, our quality of life is not going to be the same. And if you survive, good for you, but life will not be the way it was. There is no new normal. So I think we're, we're living in it. I actually think that COVID was a part of all of this, what we've been talking about. Um, and so, um, well, I don't, where do we end here? We're, we're almost out of time. Where do we end here? Well, we've taken 29 minutes to paint a horrible picture of where we're at. Um, perhaps it's another show to say, what are, what are the solutions? And I keep going back to following the money trail. And the money trail is the, the political action campaigns that, you know, stuff the, the money in the pockets of our politicians to do nothing, on purpose, do nothing. And so how do you stop that? Um, you know, our own congressman, uh, he's doing something about it. He's trying to do campaign reform, um, political action campaign reform. But you have a Supreme Court decision called Citizens United that says more money, the better, dark money, the better. And until we get a handle on that portion of the money to stop greasing the palms of our politicians, uh, you know, we could have 100,000 of these shows and it won't make a difference. Yeah, and we could have 100,000 young people all joining cause organizations, um, but that isn't making a difference. I mean, Greta, you know, in Scandinavia, she's, she's a great hero, um, but I'm sorry, it's not enough. We have to change the way we live and function um, under government and in a society. Um, it, this is an emergency, a climate emergency. Many people have called it that, but the, the world is not treating it that way. There's nobody in power actually calling for that. So I think we're going to have to ride this, ride, this, ride this thing right down until we find out, I mean, in a, in a very uh, well, we, unpleasant humans, way. Well, we learn the hard way, unfortunately. Um, we bring ourselves to the brink of extinction before we do it. anything about it. Yeah. So, okay, if, if I made you president of the world and I gave you the authority and I gave you the money, you know, no limitation, what could you, would you do to save the planet and the people? I'll say it again. You have to go attack how, how and why our governments other governments in the world are nothing are doing nothing about this problem, seriously doing nothing about it. And that is the direct influence of money in politics and the, the, the bought and paid politicians that know they have a duty, an ethical, moral duty for future generations, yet they ignore it because they've been paid, bought and sold. So you would have to go after how campaign contributions um, are made in this country. And and put severe limitations on it. Yeah, and it's about caring for your neighbor, including your neighbor around the world. I mean, I, I have a certain amount of sympathy, although the Chinese are, you know, aggressively trying to get all our national security. I have a certain amount of sympathy for the ordinary people who are dying in the flood right now. Um, I think we all have to care. Everybody has to care about, you know, his co-human being, wherever that person is. And we really have to care about the people in Vermont and Louisiana and gee, every state you can think of, um, because we can't let them linger. We can't abandon them. We have to find a path for them. If that means another neighborhood, another house, another life, another job, we have to do that. We have to have the smartest policy we've ever had. And we don't. I'm sorry. 
Um, so it really means um, a collaborative effort in the full sense of collaboration. Collaboration in the country, collaboration in Europe and Asia, collaboration in the world. And, and the question I put to you, Tim, is, is the species capable of that? Of course. Yes. <laughs> We're, the species is intelligent when it wants to be. The species is intelligence when it's free of, of abuse of power of leadership. The species can survive if they can see fit to figure out what is stymieing their progress. Uh, the answer is a qualified yes. Hmm. All right. Well, I hope we all survive the current process, not only the insidious process around Donald Trump, um, but the, the existential threats of climate change, all of this being visited upon us at the same time. You know, we've lived a nice life since World War II, mostly, um, but now it's, uh, it's judgment day. That's what I think. And we have really better uh, learn from what our experience has been. Your final thoughts? Uh, just to go back to um, if the species is up to it. The species was up to it um, after the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were at the brink of nuclear uh, destruction for the entire world, the entire planet. Um, cool minds prevailed. We started putting in systems to prevent a, a sudden accidental nuclear war amongst nations. Uh, this is no different as far as the scale of importance. It's possible, and I think we can, be, we can do the job. We're up to it. And I'll go back to something I've said many times to you before. It's about leadership. Um, one good moral leader can change the world, and a group of moral leaders can change the world, and it's time they stepped up. We need the best leadership we can possibly have now. We cannot tolerate some of the abuses and the moral crises that, uh, that, that we have on our, our plate right now. So let's keep talking about this, Tim. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.